for that because anything that has anybody's name on it, that means it was invented by somebody else. That's kind of the rule. Uh, now, we look at the balance sheet channel, I want to think about other things that, that could also be problematic. Like one effect might be the effect on what's called market liquidity. So funding liquidity, that's the ability to borrow. Market liquidity, well that's can you buy and sell securities in asset markets? Is that a problem? So what we're going to look at is that. Now it turns out, for example, why would market, uh, why would market liquidity be affected? Well, for one thing, the costs of market making are probably going to go to the extent that that's going to be financed and to the extent that interest rates, not necessarily the commercial paper rate, that might not be the relevant one for this, but some other one, uh, uh, the cost of borrowing that market makers have, if that goes up, well, if the cost of market making go up, the spreads are going to widen, the spreads are going to widen, and that could do a couple things. Uh, one, it's going to cause market makers to, to uh, charge more to provide liquidity. That's one thing that could happen. And uh, another thing that can happen, besides increasing bid ask spreads, is that maybe in equilibrium, trading volume would fall. Well, that's pretty clearly going to happen, because if trading costs go up, people aren't going to buy and sell as much. And then maybe there is a third thing that can happen, which is in equilibrium, uh, asset prices might fall a little bit. And the reason they might fall a little bit there is, well, sort of more generally, if you can't get out of it, there's two reasons. One is, if you think about an equilibrium with transaction costs in it, if you have to pay more, and there's other assets where with those other assets you don't have to pay these transaction costs in equilibrium, you're going to shift your money out of the ones where the transaction costs are higher into the other ones. And what will happen is the equilibrating rate will make it so that sort of the after transaction cost of uh, expected returns will be the same, which means the pre-transaction cost returns, including those costs, will have to go up, which means the only way that's going to happen is if asset values will go down. So that's one thing that can happen. But if, if you think more generally, just the inability to sell when you need to, that's liquidity risk, which of course I didn't say here, but I realize I need to say that too. That's liquidity risk. If you can't get out of your asset, that means you're going to demand a higher premium to hold that thing. And of course, that's a big problem in the housing market uh, right there. You think that just having uh, the inability to get up your house would also uh, cause housing values to fall all by itself, even without this sort of microstructure transaction cost reason uh, for, for uh, asset prices to fall. But it's all of a piece. It's the same, it's the same kind of thing. So, that's, uh, so, so you can see that there's going to be problems uh, that uh, funding liquidity can affect market liquidity, which can then b basically, that, that can cause asset values to fall, sort of a vicious, uh, a vicious circle, because if asset values fall, perhaps if uh, some of these asset values are held by, um, uh, some of these assets are held by banks, that could further reinforce the funding liquidity problem, because maybe they have less to lend because the assets on their books have fallen in the first place. So you can see, so this is something that Brunemeyer and Peterson in a very recent paper, I think it's still forthcoming in the Review of Financial Studies, uh, talk about. Okay, they have a model, and it's, this paper is pretty well cited since it's hardly been out there. It's got like hundreds and hundreds of sites because it talks about these uh, liquidity death spirals. And we have to worry about death spirals now because the Olympics are coming up and we've seen all that with that figure skating. It's not the same as a death spiral in figure skating. But you are kind of the idea is that funding market liquidity affects funding liquidity, and then funding liquidity can actually make uh, uh, sorry, can funding liquidity affects market liquidity, which can make funding liquidity worse, and you get this sort of liquidity spiral. And you can also have a loss spiral associated with that, with where asset values are falling at the same time. And uh, so the focus of our paper is testing their model. Now, why why are we doing an historical experiment? Well. Because everything is easier in the 19th century. Financial institutions are, are less well developed, and you can find an exogenous shock for something. You can say, oh, well, you have a shock here. Let's see how it plays out through the financial system. Whereas what's going on today, they have no idea. With this really complicated market, everything's endogenous. You can't test any. Well, you can, test, you can look at correlations, but then pretty much you have to, uh, have to slit your wrist because you're done. You, it's very difficult to. Uh, identify the effects of one thing on another with all the endogeneity that you have. So that's why 
what we, what, what we do, we, we would say it's very difficult to identify this, uh, the effect of capital or margin requirements on financial markets um, uh, from other shocks. So you can't actually see what shock is driving it. But in the 19th century, it's very easy to see what's going on because you know exactly where the shock well, you don't know exactly, but we have a pretty good idea of exactly where the shock is coming. So to say, fortunately, history provides a natural experiment to examine the effect of the impact of the, essentially an exogenous change in funding liquidity. So that's where the shock's going to be. It's going to be in funding liquidity. And we're going to see how that affects market liquidity and a bunch of other stuff, like stock returns. That's what we're trying to do. All right. So back at, yeah, you can see I did a bad job on these slides. Too many words, I know. This is because I've never given this talk before. I have to keep, make sure I keep everything in line. So back in the 19th and early 20th centuries, you had a bunch of, you had a bunch of financial crises. There was one in 1819, 1857, 1873, 1890, and 